Thank you. Everybody knows Sean, right? <laughs> Thank Sean for another amazing Drupal Camp New Jersey and all the organizers. <laughs> so, um, I'm Amanda Kanako. This is Ray Saltini. Okay. <laughs> Mind. Supposed to be more on your toes. So, um, thank you for joining us after lunch. Uh, I am still Ray Saltini, and my esteemed colleague Amanda are really pleased to be back with you all uh, here. Every once in a while, we're here uh, at Bell Works. Um, I was just there two weeks recently where I saw my colleague for the first time in two years and some of my other colleagues as well. So it's great to be out and about a little bit and I hope we're all stay safe and that you've been as good as you can be. We are thoroughly excited yes, uh, are. to present today. How many folks are really familiar with design systems? Okay, well that makes none of us, no. Uh, <laughs> and, and so how many folks have like maybe heard about it a little bit and worked with it? Okay, all right, still awesome. awesome. So we're gonna go through this at a pretty good clip, and we're gonna remind ourselves not to go too, too fast, because we know folks are maybe just becoming familiar with design systems. And what we wanna cover is that spectrum of uh, how d design systems can come into existence uh, and then really be extended through, through an enterprise organization, right? And, just in case you weren't sure of what panel, what session you're in today. So, um, again, it's so glad, great to be here with you all. It is our 10th uh, uh, camp uh, at uh, FFW. Um, uh, I am uh, the director of solutions uh, for FFW. Uh, I started uh, with FFW about 10 years ago doing some training. Uh, and have done a couple of jobs in between then. And Amanda. And I'm Amanda Kanopko. I'm the head of the content design team um, at FFW. And for those of you who aren't sure what content design is, at FFW it's um, a mix of UX design, um, UX writing, as well as we take a content first approach to all of our UX. And together, uh, we you work as. Do you need to stay on the mic? The mic ah. the Thank you. And together, we are part of the strategy team at FFW, working very closely with sales and accounts, of course, and our development uh, team. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of us spread out in different spots. Uh, our home base, actually, in the US uh, is right here in New Jersey in home Dell. Um, and so we want to spend this time talking about something that's become really kind of essential for a lot of our clients, right? And for many of them, it's uh, a challenge. And of course, because we uh, are also providing strategy services to them, we begin with an explanation that these are actually opportunities. Uh, and so we start with that, that, that premise uh, around consistency leading to opportunities to help organizations scale and to actually become more efficient, which helps them scale and be more consistent. <laughs> and so we're gonna we're gonna trade off here. We, this is not rehearsed. Okay, <laughs> we've talked about this a lot, but it is not rehearsed. So, um, so. A design system is, is really, um, along this spectrum, a collection of standards that are used by organizations in order to make sure that their brand presence uh, is consistent across different uh, departments and uh, organizations, markets, uh, with, within enterprise um, enterprises. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of benefits uh, of them. Consistency is a big theme. You'll hear us repeat over and over again. But there are also quite a few other, other benefits. 
Yep, and a design system is a combination of a lot of things. And we're gonna talk to you after this a little bit about um, the different fidelities of a design system. But design systems come together with code snippets, um, they come together with design assets, annotations, um, you can have your analytics and tracking code also in there. You should have your style guidelines, your brand guidelines. So it should be a combination of all of those things to really help you build out and scale um, these experiences. And some of the benefits with having all of that put together is that you can really decrease your maintenance and you can also um, you know, make sure that there's not that technical debt or that design debt that comes in when you're all working in teams, um, you know, separately. You might be working with lots of vendors or different partners, um, and a lot of the time, you know, they're each gonna bring their own flair, but if you have a design system, that's really gonna bring it together for you so that you have that collective set of guidelines for everyone to follow. Um, it also changes the way that you work with your partners. It changes the way you work internally with your teams. Um, John has been a great help with a lot of the design systems that I've been working on. Um, and, you know, as a tech lead and as the lead of content, we're working together to make sure that we're bringing together language, that we're making sure that we're splitting things up in a way in our design system, in our design assets, the way that he's also going to build it so that we're working together to make sure that that's going to stay cohesive. Um, and then it positions you for maturity. So as you grow, you can iterate on these things as well. Anything well else? said, well said. No, and I, I would just reinforce that, you know, the, one of the key benefits of this, as Amanda talked about, is the ability to change the way you think within your organization, particularly the way siloed teams can start to uh, change the way they think about how things get implemented. Right, so they don't just look for the style guide to f make sure they understand what color to use, but they can actually reach in and use a tool that has not just colors applied to it, but the proper framing and lockup for a logo or any number of other things, which we're gonna talk about. It's Amanda's laptop. <laughs> so implementing a design system um, can be something that you can get going quite simply and uh, effectively quite quickly. Um, and it's also something you can spend about two million bucks trying to really make work throughout your uh, enterprise organization. Uh, we suggest not starting with the two million dollar, at the two million dollar end, you know, but working your way up to it. And so like a lot of strategy that we provide for our clients it really is about a walk, uh, crawl, walk, run, you know, philosophy, so that folks get that kind of just in time benefit from design design systems, and sometimes that starts very simply with a style guide, but it can move very quickly to online uh, tools. Uh, and you know, when you start out you may be starting out with just that experience design layer. You might be annotating inside of your design file. You might be splitting things up there. There's not gonna be any code snippets yet. It's just about setting up the kind of principles um, to the design system. And then as you're walking, you can then start to implement some of those code snippets. Maybe you put um, your components now into a build kit or a pattern library so that you can easily iterate on those things, um, build out prototypes very quickly. Um, and then once you get into that run stage, then you're bringing in experience design, technology, and you're also bringing in that data layer, making sure that as you're going to be tracking these things, that you're gonna track them consistently across all of the different platforms and all of the different channels that you're launching these types of components and this design system on. Um, and then there's more than that. You know, you're, you're adding additional documentation once you get into that enterprise design system level. 
Um, you know, you're adding more about the usage of these components. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about components in a, in a bit if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I talk about components. Um, but, you know, there's those different stages. So it's experience, experience and technology, experience, technology, and data is how we like to think of it. And as you mature in your practice, um, this uh, important baseline, this single source of truth, grows you know, across your channels, across your touch points, um, but is, is really established very early on, even at the crawl stage, so that you can begin to get some immediate returns. So this is just gonna give you a little bit more of an understanding of all the things that go into those different phases. So you're gonna see there's about three things under each of those crawl, walk, run stages. Um, for your annot annotated design guidelines, you're gonna have actual design guidelines. You're gonna have a style guide. Um, you're gonna have that component library. When you're building out those components, they should be reusable. Um, you should be thinking about the types of content that are going to go into those components, setting up guidelines for how those should be used so that they're being used consistently across your experience. And then you should be annotating along the whole way, um, making sure that as you're making decisions, if you're the stakeholder, be annotating that as well. Or if you're working with a stakeholder, make sure that you're annotating so that you can refer back and say, this is the type of functionality that we decided on, and this is how it's going to be used. Um, then we've got component libraries. When we talk about that, that's really adding in that build layer. Um, so there's a lot of tools that you can use. We're going to get into the tools a little bit later, um, but some of those are pattern, pattern libraries. Um, and you're gonna start layering in um, ways to easily prototype. So those um, different components are actually gonna be built out in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. They're gonna be living, breathing things uh, that you can reference. Mm -hmm. And then you can easily put those together to be able to see how maybe that page is gonna look before you actually go out and rebuild everything. Um, also, when you get into enterprise design systems, you're going to see that, you know, these things become a little bit more shareable. Um, you might be able to send this link out to your partners as well. It's not only an internal tool that might be built in your Drupal instance anymore. Um, you might use a tool set to help do that. And then also integrating, making sure that you're giving those analytics specifications so that you can iterate on the experience over time. And so how many folks work for um, organizations that use Drupal, if you will? And how many folks work at in higher ed? How many folks work in life sciences or pharma? And so higher, higher ed. Um, and so how, and, um, how many developers do we have in the room? How many designers do we have in the room? OK, good. So, uh, and how many marketing communications people do we have in the room? Okay, so the marketing communications, folks, even I see one of these. Uh, it's probably, that's a developer and a marketing communications. I'm an event planner. An event planner, brilliant. <laughs> so one of the things that's really important about the design systems for folks from all different sectors, right? Um, and we're gonna talk about higher ed specifically in a second, that's why I'm doing a little um, uh, a call game, um, uh, it's essential to understand that design systems are not just for designs, right? And design systems are as much for governance, right? Design systems are as much for content guidelines. Design systems are as much for compliance, right, as they are for, for design, right? Visual design and other things. And the no matter what level of your organization is at, no matter what level of maturity, right, you can use a design system to support advancement and in fact acceleration on all these fronts. And so we work with a lot of higher ed organizations that struggle to maintain 
WCAG 88 compliance, right? And as soon as something is launched, it's compliant, and then a minute later, when someone generates some, some content or puts in a table, it's busted. It's not compliant any longer, right? That's a type of problem a design system can help mitigate and help reduce. Um, someone deciding that they uh, want to do things a little bit differently in their one-off, one-page landing site, that becomes much more disincentivized with design systems. And so that's a part of the governance. And it's, we like to think that design systems are really good with governance with carrots rather than governance with sticks because they really provide great incentives for different organizations and departments to get on board because it makes their work easier. Design systems also drive data-driven decision-making, which is really important. So if you have a design system where each of your components has specific tracking, you're able to really think about those user journeys, see how users are interacting with each of those pieces of your site, and then prioritize what things that you actually want to iterate on. Um, it becomes super, super important when you know, you're know you building a product over time or you are, um, maybe you have a tight timeline for something, that data is gonna really help you prioritize so that you can meet that timeline, meet that deadline. Yep. So again, we already talked about this a little bit, but um, design systems, they inform every team. So they're not just for designers. Um, we're kind of the starting point for a design system. Um, and we'll use them to extend, to iterate, um, to see if there's something already existing instead of creating something new when we are um, not doing like a full redesign. Um, but it also sets guidelines for marketing teams, for product managers, how to use those components correctly, um, how to write content for those components. Um, also, when you're just creating general marketing materials that are also gonna be in the digital space, it's going to help you kind of stay compliant in that design system by giving you those guidelines. Um, for engineers, again, it's giving them the power to really be able to prototype quickly um, and also to kind of understand some of those functional requirements as well for how this thing should be built. Um, and then analytics, again, if we're measuring and we're creating measurement plans, then you can help extend those data layers over time, scale those, and it informs those priorities for iteration. So um, this is the part about the carrot, right? Especially in governance, where in order to get the most out of your systems, you know it's rarely a technical problem, right? It's usually a very human problem. Right? People are in their silos, it's difficult to communicate with them, and it's especially difficult to convey the type of value of the work you're doing, right? whether or not you're in an IT capacity or a communications capacity. One of the great things about design systems, they demo really well. Right? So you can take your design system, no matter what stage along the path to maturity it is, and really show people how it can benefit them instead of having to tell them how it can benefit them. And it's, the benefits are really clear for different groups within your organizations. And what slowly starts to happen is they realize that in order to make the design system work for themselves, in order to get the most out of it, they actually have to work together a little bit and come out of their silos. But there's great incentive to do that, right? Because it reduces development time, it reduces development complexity, it reduces unexpected costs and, and delays and uh, in all the things you see listed on our slide, right? Not the least of which 
is great insights in order to begin experimenting with what works better here or there. So um, no matter what type of organization you're in, but particularly for organizations that tend to be highly siloed higher education organizations, anybody? Um, uh, it's a particularly good tool uh, to address that. And any partner who does not want a design system would be silly. That's the first thing that we always ask when we bring in a client is do you have a set of guidelines for us to help iterate on? What sort of styles should we be following? Um, and it really helps to be able to kind of have that starting point and then to also feel like you're contributing to that. Um, and it makes you want to follow those guidelines a little bit more because if you're contributing, then you want to make sure that you're being consistent so that others are going to be consistent with your work as well. So, as with so many things, there's a, a right way, a wrong way, and a lot of ways in between. What's essential, of course, is that you figure out the best way, the optimal way for your organization. But when you distill these down to a really concise uh, body of practice, one of the three of the things that we have found at FFW to be super, super, super important, right, is uh, being verbose, annotating our, our work, our components, right, um, being smart about how we label them. Any Drupal taxonomy fans in the room, right? Really important namespacing and then using it and applying it consistently in a way that makes sense. And then measuring your progress. Now these are really essential, smart best practices for every organization, but in particular if you're looking to grow an enterprise uh, uh, design system in your really big siloed uh, organization, these, will, these are the things that will help you all speak the same language. And uh, as the content design team at FFW, we really strive to annotate our components, not just in a way of this is functionally how something is going to work, so that the UX is actually built right, but we are also thinking about the usage of that component. We are designing in a content first way, so we wanna make sure that if a component is supposed to be used for only specific types of content on your site, that we're giving you those guidelines so that you can then build pages accurately your user experience is not going to suffer because you're maybe using a component that you shouldn't be in certain areas. It's gonna help build that user journey. It's gonna help build that muscle memory for your users. It's gonna make a consistent experience. Um, so we strive to not just be thinking about, okay, well, how can I describe this to pass this off to our dev team? It's also how can we give you guys the best chance of using these things correctly when you're editing content or you're creating new design systems or new designs off of the design system. Um, labeling accurately is a huge thing. Um, content designers love language. <laughs> so sometimes we wanna come up with what language we think is best for that component, but that's not always the best way to go. You have to communicate with your other teams and make sure that you're all gonna be calling that thing the same type of language. So if someone calls something a carousel, and then the devs call it a slider, and then in your data tracking, you're calling it a featured content interaction. Or that pager thingy. <laughs> then how are, how are you connecting the dots between the three in your design system, in your design file, in maybe your pattern lab or in the back end of Drupal um, and then being able to tie that to the data. Um, and, and, and this is a critical point about management that Amanda makes, right? Because we've worked with a lot of organizations that have it together, right? They've got a style guide. 
But then what they've got to do is explain to every single department how to use the style guide. And they've got to explain to every single department what each component looks like and what, what different components are going to be used for and then what the best practice for those different components are. So I've been with Drupal for a little while, 4.6. The rigor uh, of uh, Drupal of, of at the time was, hey, we can just put a little bit of PHP in a block and it'll run, right? And it did, and never mind it was a security threat, it ran, right? Who cared about security threats in 2005, right? A lot of people. But the point is, once we put a PHP code in a block, it was gone. We didn't know where it was. When we passed it off to a different developer, they didn't know where it was. And so we built these great sites that no one could manage. Right? And design systems are as much about management as they are about, governance, about design, governance, compliance, and the, and the like. And so I hope nobody's putting PHP snippets in their blocks anymore. And want. then also, you know, you can have usage, you can have style, you can have code snippets, you can have um, that data layer that we've been talking about for specific components and those bite-sized pieces. But bringing in accessibility, what are the guidelines for accessibility on this specific piece of your site? Um, also SEO for our marketing folks out there. Um, that's something that you want to get into as your kind of building out that design system further and thinking about your content. So tools, everyone loves tools. Um, we use a lot of these. Um, it depends on our, our client's needs of how we're gonna pair these things together. Um, these are some of the systems that we have used pretty regularly. Um, zero height, I would say, out of all of these, is going to be like your the big burrito. How, how many folks? Zero height, raise hands. One. Okay. Wow. We're, folks are learning something. It's <laughs> so awesome. zero height is one of my personal favorites. We just started working with it, um, but it's a way for you to bring in like those pattern libraries that the developers are building and then also put your Figma file or your sketch file, pull that in and then put the annotation layer on top of that. And it's kind of its own content management system. So it makes it really, really, really easy for everyone to go in and update it. So your partners can help update this too. Um, it's not just gonna be on you to be updating this system or on the developers when a designer says, hey, I want to add in this extra annotation for them to add it into the code. No, it's on that designer now to go in and add that. Um, so zero height is one of my favorites. View design system, um, anyone use that? Or we're on a roll. That one, um, again, you can add those annotations in. It's like one level down, I would say. Um, but it's gonna pull in your code snippets. Again, it's gonna let you um, give best practices. Pattern Lab is one that's a, mostly based on front end, I would say. Um, and it's going to be mostly developer based. So once you hand that design system off to a developer, they're gonna be able to put that into Pattern Lab, but they're gonna have to keep that up to date. Pattern Lab works really nicely with Drupal though. So that's, that's a good um, system if you're going to want to build off of um, your Drupal site. You can connect them so that it can work off of your Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab? More folks, right? Yeah. That one's a little bit more common. Right. A little harder to annotate, though. Um, yes. So that one is more of that, when you're thinking about that crawl, walk, run, that's the walk stage. Um, U.S. Web Design System. That is a mouthful. Anyone use that? Two people, very good. And that's gonna really give you like principles, guidelines for um, government websites. And can I ask, what have you used it for? So I haven't actually used it on a project, but I was trained on it by my government summit committee. There you go. Very good. So they, they walked me through it so that I could understand what it is 
facilitate the summit. Wonderful. And forgive me, in the back, what? Uh, use this to design. We're going to we're design, be designing the New Jersey court system. Ah, so, yeah, we're both in government. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great starting point. It reminds me of like a bootstrap type of deal. It's going to give you a solid set of components to start with. Um, and there are a lot of government sites that use it. So if you go visit their website, you're gonna see sites and you're gonna be like, whoa, that's built on this framework, cool. Um, and then Storybook. So Storybook is another one that's similar to Pattern Lab. It works with zero height, so you can pull in your code snippets from Storybook. Um, so that's a tool that we've been using recently. It's mostly front end, all about the UI, being able to test things and iterate things quickly. Storybook? Oh, all right. And so and one of the things, of course, is that many of these work together. And your organization may want to combine them in different ways. And they also work very well with tools like Confluence, right, which you're used to documenting things in, or many organizations are used to documenting things. There are a lot of clients that come to us in the crawl stage where we're using Figma, or sketch, whatever they're coming to us with. And instead of documenting directly in that tool, because maybe everyone doesn't have a license to that tool, and then they can't see those annotations, we'll tend to use Confluence um, or another wiki style tool so that people can access the um, annotations a little bit more easily. Dun, dun, dun. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the design systems that we've implemented. Ram, I'm gonna pass it off to you. So to we've done just a little bit of work for the Stanford uh, SPCS uh, organization, basically um, departments and schools within the Stanford University system uh, that uh, uh, have come to uh, us and we've, I think Stanford is uh, probably our longest running client, I think 12 years. Uh, Princeton's been a, a, a partner for nine years. Um, but Stanford had this very, you know, uh, rigid platform and um, they uh, couldn't do what they, they needed to do and different divisions couldn't do what they needed to do and there was great incentive to be creative and spin, you know, single page sites up and, and the like. So they really wanted a way to pull together this part of the university um, system. And so um, we focused specifically on um, building a site with components that would be um, durable in, in their uh, AA compliance. Right for WCAG, that was a key consideration uh, for them, and so we were able to put together a solution that very qu quickly served both their ex external team with two sites, but also an intranet site, which, as you know, intranet sites can be not the most fun places to visit and spend time. Right in the past, and it's a real disconnect for folks within the organization that have to use them. And when you have those disconnects, you don't get documentation that's updated and you don't get people putting good information into the system. So they found uh, it extremely uh, worthwhile. Uh, and so the project was expanded on a broader scale with more uh, uh, university offices. And so um, you have here uh, a description of one of the the institutes for international studies uh, at Stanford that extended right what the other Stanford folks did to 41 centers and programs and initiatives. And so what happened at Stanford was you you know it started mushrooming right and getting really popular. And again, this is that incentive right to because. It, it works and it just becomes easier, you know. And eventually, as is our goal with most of our clients, uh, they became more and more self-sufficient. And now um, they have, if we had that uh, site there, uh, that, that slide, 
they're quite far to the right of an open, shareable design, design system. Um, am I leaving anything out there? When you're dealing with many departments, um, it tends to be difficult to try and wrangle the needs of all of those departments. Um, so it's really important when you're building a design system um, that you're getting insights from all of those different individuals or people who are going to be using it to make sure that they're going to buy in and they're going to use it in the correct way. Um, and to make sure that you're building out components that are gonna be useful for everyone. Um, and that's a really important part of the process is to really understand the needs of the design system to start and then to iterate on that over time. And the Stanford sites were uh, built on the Pantheon uh, platform, which had their own, had their own um, unique way of uh, spinning up uh, additional sites, which uh, connected and worked with the design systems that we created for them. Um, and so another little place just around the corner, based in Newark, Panasonic, uh, has invested heavily in design systems to the extent that uh, they have been able to power their um, B2B um, uh, sites uh, and even expand that investment in that platform to their B2C sites, right, and also to their B2C CA sites in Canada. And so um, many folks don't know that uh, Panasonic, which when I was a little bit younger, it used to have a huge presence in the retail market, right, in the United States. They still maintain that in Canada and in many other regions. And they do things like put batteries in electric cars like Teslas. So they've got this huge um, platform that uh, functions, that's connected to uh, a product database that's connected to a Drupal platform that's built with a design system that is able to scale across all their different markets and start to accommodate all these different uses and channels. Move it along. And um, as we're, we're, we're running down, we're gonna shift gears and go to, go to questions, but if you'd like, just last month, um, if you want to talk really big, uh, in particular about design system thinking, right? Because there are many different evolutions of, of it, many different things that design systems can revolve around, okay? And this was uh, a case around how design thinking was built off an Acquia platform and an Acquia suite. Uh, of tools for a little thing called the Super Bowl, right? And uh, in particular, if anyone was watching just for the advertisements and you saw Mary J. Blige uh, talk, uh, you know, test giving testimonial for the whole logic uh, life sciences medical devices uh, organization, we were very proud to spin up that uh, campaign within just six weeks. And we could do it because um, uh, they were really highly invested in design system thinking. So check out our presentation. Yeah, when you only have six weeks to design and build something, it's really important to be able to look at a library of components, understand their usage very quickly, and say, okay, we could reuse these things for this. Now we have to design only one component. We don't have to design this whole page, just one thing. Now we can focus on that. The developers don't have to rebuild all of the things that already exist. So when you have tight deadlines like this, super important to be able to use your design system. That's all, folks. That's all. We're, let's keep the questions on the recording. There we go. We have guidance. John. Nope. <laughs> John's being called out.
out today. Yes. <laughs> Let's call out all the FFW folks. Jason, David, no. Questions, comments? Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for being here, allowing us to brag a little bit, uh, well, maybe more than a little bit, but um, hopefully uh, there's some take-homes here that you can share with your organizations or just uh, use it to inform your thinking. Um, and so uh, have a great, great camp. Stay safe. Also, one other thing, if you want to look at like really good design systems, check out like Uber, Lyft, like just check out any sort of app that you use regularly. A lot of those design systems are readily available to everyone. So check them out. Yeah. Um, that's a good way to like get a vision of what a full enterprise design system could look like. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.